All right, let's give the band just a round of applause. Can we do that? Love what they do for us as we kind of usher into a conversation with God. You can see by the trailer there, our little sermon uh, bumper video is what we call it sometimes, that we are going to walk through a great journey as a church family asking the question, all of 2020, who is Jesus? How do we fill in that blank? Jesus is what? And so we're going to take kind of this slow walk with Jesus through the gospel of John. We're gonna actually finish the entire Gospel of John in one year. We're gonna walk through it as a church, every Sunday walking through, asking the question, who is Jesus? And so we're very excited about this opportunity. We think it's the best New Year's resolution that you could have is to say, I'm gonna journey in God's word. We ask ourselves as a pastoral staff, what would be really exciting for our people to do in 2020? And we all kind of got together and said, wouldn't it be great if we could get all of our people through the gospel of John in one year. If we could kind of just slow things down and say, let's just journey on a kind of a slow walk, a stroll with Jesus, and really have an intimate conversation with him and really understand his identity and the reality of who he is for us. This was such a good idea that I took it (laughs) and I put it as a part of one of our family goals that we as a family are gonna walk through the Gospel of John and one of my New Year's resolutions, my wife and I's New Year's resolution is that we would teach our kids this year how to read their Bible on their own. How to read their Bible on their own. My oldest are 10 and eight. We're not gonna do it with the two-year-old and the two-week-old, we're gonna wait a little bit on them, but the 10-year-old and the eight-year-old, we wanna walk through the Gospel of John with them and teaching them here's how you can read the Bible on your own without mommy and without daddy but just you, your Bible, and the Spirit of God. And so we're excited about that. We want to make it really easy on you. And so maybe you saw as you came in, as you walked up the stairs and you're on those landings there before you get into the front doors, there's these journals. These are Gospel of John journals. We bought a journal for everybody who comes to our church. So we want you to take one of these as either either as you are coming in or as you're leaving, we want you to take a Gospel of John journal. It's got the Gospel of John on one side and a journal on the other side. So you can uh, put entries in and do those things. So we're going to jump in to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Now before we get there, I just want to say... Thank you for being hospitable. Thank you for being a great church to our guest preachers. We had three guest preachers kind of come in. Well, one was internal, Pastor Steve, who did a great job. Uh, Last week, we also had Pastor Curtis, Pastor Glenn, friends of mine that came in because we were waiting uh, for uh, Maddox to come, our fourth child, our third son. And he came, and he came in in a big way, and he, he was nine pounds Uh, which uh, he already weighs more than me, uh, so that's great. Uh, But he is here, and he is sleeping well. Mom is doing great. Uh, He is doing great. Kids are having a ton of fun. Uh, My my youngest son, well, it used to be my youngest son, Dexter, he's still trying to figure out if he likes having a new baby around. So we can work with that, but he's too. He'll figure out. He'll figure that out. So thank you. I just want to say thank you for being hospitable to those guest preachers. Let's just jump right in. John chapter 1 verse one, and here's what I wanna do. As we jump into this, I think John's gonna ask a question, or he's gonna answer a question, and I think this is the question. The question is, who will conquer the darkness? Who will conquer the darkness? In the first paragraph of the Gospel of John, I think he's trying to answer this question. Who will conquer the darkness? The darkness which is evil, the darkness inside of us and the darkness around us. Who will conquer the darkness, and I think in John 1, 1 through 5, he's gonna answer that question. But let's just take that idea of darkness just for a moment. As you think of that, when you think of that word darkness, what comes to your mind? I'll tell you what comes to my mind. I was terrified, terrified of dark places as a kid. So when I hear the word darkness, there's a lot of emotion that is packed into that term. You see, when I was a really, really young kid, I had a very traumatic experience in a dark room. I was sleeping one day on my bed. I was sleeping in this very dark room, no nightlight, no nothing like that. And I was under the covers because that's how I liked to sleep, in the darkness with the cover over me. That's what I liked. Well, that night was different than any other night. My dad came into that room not knowing that I was asleep and unaware that I was even in the bed. And he had been drinking pretty heavily that night. 
And he sat at the edge of the bed, and I felt the mattress kind of turn or shift a little bit as he sat on the corner of my bed. Again, totally unaware that I was there, totally unaware that I was sleeping. I was always a little guy, so me under the covers, you couldn't tell. And as he sat on the corner of the bed, he started to speak these thoughts, these depressing thoughts, these sad thoughts, these thoughts that made him come to the conclusion, at least verbally, that he should end his life. And I remember being under those covers, crying, sweating, but not wanting to make a movement, not wanting to say anything, not wanting to make a noise. I was terrified. I didn't understand how to grapple with these kind of thoughts as a child that my dad was thinking about taking his life. Now, he eventually fell asleep, kind of right there where he was, never did anything with those thoughts, and I never even brought it up to him. But that traumatic experience scarred me when it came to dark places. A couple years later, I had a bad dream, and I remember waking up, and I was at my mom's house, and I remember standing at the door of my bedroom. And in my bedroom, the lights were on because at that point, I couldn't sleep with the lights off. But I stared down the hallway, the kind of corridor in our apartment, and I stared down the hallway into the living room, and the living room was completely black and dark. I remember standing there at the doorway, looking down this dark hallway, and I was paralyzed, just paralyzed in fear. And I want to run to my mom's room. That was the escape that I thought, but I was paralyzed by fear because I was afraid if I made any movement that I would awaken whatever was in the darkness, <laughs> that I would cause whatever that, that person or that thing to chase after me. And I just stood there in fear, unable to move. Now, maybe when you think of darkness, you don't think of those things. You don't think of being afraid of a dark room as a kid. But I want you to entertain this idea. I think all of us, in a sense, are like me when I was a boy, standing at the doorway of a room, looking down a dark hallway. I think, in a sense, we're all doing that. I think the hallway is our life. And at the end is darkness. At the end is death. And not just death, but what happens after death? Not just the ending of our lives, our hearts stop beating, our brains stop working, but what happens at the end of life? Is there a reckoning for the life that we lived, a judgment for the life that we lived, an assessment of what we've done, good or bad? In a sense, all of us look down that hallway, and the further we look down to the end of our life, we see darkness. Not only will what I know end, but I'm not certain what will happen even after that end. And there may be a judgment after that end. I remember as a teenager contemplating that thought, and that darkness scared me more than the darkness in a living room down a hallway. I remember as a teenager grappling with that idea, even as a teenage boy, knowing what I had done. When I looked down the corridor of my life and I looked at my life would one day end and I would enter into that darkness, I was afraid that the darkness in me would destroy me. Because I knew there would be a day of reckoning. I knew there would be a day of judgment. Even before I ever even went into a church, I knew there would be some sense of judgment and accounting for what I've done. And I was paralyzed by that fear, just like I did when I was a young boy standing in the hallway looking down into the dark living room. When I looked past the end of my life, I thought to myself, if there is a judgment, I'm not going to pass. It's not going to be in my favor. I think in a sense, we all think about that. And I think what John is going to do for us in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, is he's going to speak to that kind of darkness, the darkness in us, the darkness around us, and he's going to try to answer the question, who will conquer that darkness and the answer to that question is the big idea for this morning. So take the pin out of the seat back in front of you, find that spot in your bulletin, or if you do have your journal, you can write it in there as well. Here's the answer to that question. Who will conquer the darkness? The creator is the conqueror. The creator is the conqueror. Jesus Christ, the creator, is the conqueror of that darkness. Let me show you this. John chapter 1, starting with verse 1. Let's read together. In the beginning was the word... And the word was with God, 
and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, not anything made was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So let's just start with verse 1, and let's just kind of walk through this. Let me show you first how he says that Jesus Christ is the creator God. Then he'll move to the idea this creator God is the conqueror, the conqueror of darkness. But let's just start with verse 1. Let me show you how he says that Jesus is the creator, creator God. First, he says, in the beginning was the word. Now, if you've read the Bible before, if you've read especially the first chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, when you read this, you may insert a different word. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's how the Bible starts. But John, this devout Jew, one who knew the Old Testament, probably frontwards and backwards, would memorize it, would sing it as a way to memorize it in Judaism. He changes the script. It's almost like if we were to take a, an anthem or a song that we all love and we were to change the word, that's essentially what's happening here. The first century Jewish reader would read this and say, wait, you changed a word here. That's not how the song goes. That's not how the lyric goes. That's not how the scriptures go. He doesn't say, in the beginning, God. He inserts, inserts a new character. In the beginning was the word. Well, who's this word? Is he talking about just God speaking? We do see that in Genesis chapter 1. God speaks things into creation. He's so incredibly powerful. We don't see God exerting himself, kind of molding creation with his hands in a sense, but he just speaks. He vocalizes. kind of the most simplest thing that we can do that exerts the least amount of effort. God does, and what does he do? The most powerful thing. He speaks, and everything happens. Is that what it's talking about? Is it talking about in the beginning God spoke? No, it's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about an action. He's talking about a person. You could see just if you jump down to verse 14. Verse 14 tells us who this word is. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his. What does that mean? This word is a person. We've seen his glory. He has flesh. He has dwelt among us. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, John's going to unpack this idea more and more. Who is the Word? The Word is the Son of the Father, of the Father God. And you just unpack that throughout the Gospel of John. And who is the Son? Clearly, Jesus tells us that he is the Son. His disciples say that he is the Son. John clearly lays that out in the literature later on as we go away from chapter 1 all the way to the end. It's clear the Son of God is Jesus. So who is this word? In the beginning was Jesus. Look at this as he continues on. In the beginning was Jesus, the word. And the word was with God. Now stop right there. You can circle that word with. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. Now what is he saying is that Jesus was here with God. He was, he was next to God. But this, this idea of with doesn't mean just he, he was distinct and in company with God. Uh, think about in English. We use this kind of phrase all the time in English. When we say, say you have a friend who's, who's coming over to a, a dinner party or something like that, Right? And, and, and you see another person with that person, and you ask yourself this question, you ask them this question, hey, are you with him? Now, what are you saying? You're not saying the same thing of like, did you bring your purse with you? Right? When you say that, did you bring your purse with you, you're talking about, is this thing accompanying you? Like, is it near you? Is it next to you? You're talking about proximity. But that's not what the Greek communicates in this passage, you can almost say he's with God or he's toward God is another way you can translate that in English. What is he saying here? He's saying this is more than just proximity. This is relationship. This is partnership. This word, this Jesus, is in partnership, relationship with God. There's a distinction between Jesus, the word, and God. Now, here's the hard part is the next thing he says. 
kind of throws this all out of balance a little bit. Okay, the word was with God. What else does it say? Look at the next phrase. And the word was God. Wait a second. How does that work? Go back to that same illustration. You bring a friend to the party. (laughs) Your friend comes up to you and says, are you with him and are you was him? (laughs) Are you is him? No, are you him? How are you would make that work grammatically? It's hard for us to conceive of that kind of idea. How can there be distinction? I'm with you and yet unity at the same time. How can the word be with God and God at the same time. It's a very complex idea. And here's the answer. I don't know. I don't know. And we shouldn't be surprised, but the Bible actually does this several times. The Bible kind of gives us a framework, if you will. It says, hey, this part is true, this part is true, this part is true, and this part is true. Let me give you the boundaries of what's true. Now, the answer lies within those boundaries, but I can't fully explain what's inside of those boundaries. I can just tell you where the boundaries are. Now, think about this for a moment. This devout Jew who believes in one God, in fact, he would repeat probably for himself the Shema in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 6. It was kind of a mantra of the Jewish people. They not only knew the scripture, but they knew the Shema so well. The Shema said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. In fact, we know that the Jewish people used to despise and criticize the Romans for believing in many gods. It's kind of this pantheon of gods, this polytheism, this all assortment of gods. They used to look down on that. And yet we have this devout Jew who at the center of his religious activity believes that there is one God, despises those who believe in many gods, and yet he asserts this statement right here, the word was with God and the word was God. How does that work? It's hard to understand. But when we unpack this passage and several other passages in the Bible, here's what we realize that there is distinction in God and unity in God at the same time. This would later be called the idea of the Trinity. Trinity meaning three, right? Or or, or tri meaning three, and unity meaning, well, meaning unity, right? Trinity, tri-unity. One God, but three persons, three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is calling Jesus God here very clearly. And this isn't the first time John will do this. Just look down at verse 18. Verse 18 of John chapter 1, he does the same thing. Verse 18 says this, and no one has ever seen God. Okay, just look at this sentence here. Very complex sentence here. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side has made him known. Let's just read that again. Don't miss the complexity of the sentence here. No one has ever seen God. There's a stop there. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. What did he just say? God has made God known. God the Father has been made known by the one who is at his side, God the Son. We would see later at the end of the Gospel of John, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, one of his disciples, Thomas, would look at Jesus and he would say, my Lord, my God. Yes, it is complex and it's hard to understand. God exists in a way that we don't exist. But isn't that how he should exist? If God can be explained in your mind, you know what that means? He's a creation of your mind. If all the complexity of God can be contained in your mind, then he's probably a fabrication of that mind. If he fits in here, that's where he started. But if God is real, the creator of the universe who exists beyond space, time, and reality as we know it, it's not made up of particles or matters or atoms or molecules or quasars or quarks and all that other stuff that makes up matter, right? If he is before all that, before time, before space, before matter, before all that, wouldn't he exist in a plane and in a realm and in a way that is beyond us? 
So is it surprising to us that he would exist in a way that stretches our mind, that when he comes to us and says, let me explain my existence, it's Trinity, it's tri-unity, it's one God, three persons. Yeah, you're not like that, but that's how I am. And scripture just asks us to do this. We need to submit to the mystery that there's one God, three persons. Jesus is one of those divine persons. Now, look at what he says after this. I mean, this is, a, this is a pretty strong statement here. Jesus is God. And then the next thing he says is, let me show you that he is God. He does the primary act of God. You look at any concept of any religion, if you look at the primary activity of their God, what is it? It's creation. They started all of this stuff, right? They began this work. This is exactly what he assigns to Jesus, who he's just called God. Look at verse 2. He was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. A very redundant sentence is verse 3. Look at it again, the first part. All things were made through him. He says it positively there. He made everything. He is the creator. Then he says it in a negative way. Right? It gets a little confusing. It's like that double negative. Look what he says. Without him was not anything made that was made. What is he saying there? There is nothing that has madeness that he didn't make. I know that sounds really strange. What is he trying to communicate here? Everything made. Not a single thing that was made was made apart from him. But what does that tell us about Jesus then? Jesus wasn't made. The word wasn't made. The word is the maker. He said all the list of the things that were created, all the list of the made things is right here. In fact, everything on this list was made by him. It's interesting, even if we look through this passage, the words that are used for Jesus, the word, and the words that are used for everything else. Look at them again. Let's just start with verse 1. Look at this contrast here, different Verbs, different actions, different kind of concepts are used. He says in verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's a statement of existence. But when he talks about everything else, he doesn't use that word was. He uses a different word. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. If you even look at verse 10, he was in the world, and the world was made through him. What is he doing here? He wants to separate in our minds Jesus the Word and everything else. Everything else was made. Jesus always was. Jesus does this when he's talking to a crowd in John chapter 8, verse 58. He speaks to the crowd, and he says, Before Abraham was, and it's that same word that's used for made here, Usually translated as born, before Abraham was born, before Abraham was made, Jesus says this word, before Abraham was, I am. What is Jesus saying? I'm not like everything else. I was not made like all of creation. I was not born like Abraham. I was. I always have been. There's never been a time where I was not. In fact, everything that is or that came into being came into being through me. Verses 1 through 3 make it very clear who is Jesus. He's God. How powerful is he? As powerful as God. Now John's going to get really practical here. Okay, Jesus, this word, this creator, how does that impact me, though? Because creation got spoiled, got ruined. It not take very long when you're reading the Bible. In fact, only two chapters. <laughs> the story is good for two chapters, and then it turns. <laughs> Genesis 1, Genesis 2. Yay. Genesis 3, bam, sin enters in. Darkness enters in. The great, powerful, good God created good, a good world with good people, and then sin came in and spoiled it and has made now a dark world, a spoiled world a people with darkness in them, enslaved to darkness, as the scripture would describe it. 
And as John unpacks it later, not only in this gospel, but also in the letter that he would write to his church, there's been this battle, this kind of cosmic battle, not between equal forces, but yes, between two opposing forces of light and darkness. And he says, let me tell you the character I've just introduced, this word, this God who created all things, Jesus is gonna come in and fix this. The creator will be the conqueror. Look at verse four. In him, this is the word, this is Jesus, was life, and that life was the light of man. I love this about John. And you're gonna see this as we walk through John. John is a master of wordplay. He picks the right words that just have a very full meaning to them. Just think for a moment. He just brought in two ideas. This creator is the one who brought life and brings light. If you go back to Genesis 1, these concepts are right there. The creation of all living things, that's life. God speaking light into a dark universe, God creating the stars, God creating the sun, God moving the sky so that sun could fall on the land, all of those things. I think John is kind of having two meanings here, or maybe, maybe a very full meaning here. He's saying there's something physical, that Jesus, yes, brought life and all creatures and living things, anything that moves and breathes, that's because of him. Yes, there is light, now we can see these things. Essential to life is light. But I think he's speaking on a deeper level. And we'll see this as we walk through the Gospel of John, that when he mentions life and light, he's not just talking about something physical. He's talking about something spiritual. He's talking about how Jesus has come in as the light of the world. And what does that mean? It means he's shown us the way. He's cleared up the path. Getting to God was was a path that was darkened. We did not know how to get there. We did not know where it was. Our GPS wouldn't work. But Jesus has come and he is light and he says, here's the path, let me show you it. And at the end of that path is what? It's not just physical life, it's not just a heart beating and a brain working, but it's a soul thriving. It's body and soul together reunited in resurrection life, life without death or decay, life without sadness or brokenness or disunion from God, but it's a beautiful resurrection life with God forever, proper relationship and perfect union. You see that deeper meaning that he's put there? Well, how is he going to get us there? That's verse 5. He must conquer the darkness. Verse 5 says, the creator God comes in this powerful word. It says, verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now, again, I think John, beautiful wordplay, beautiful author that he is, when he speaks of darkness, again, he has a deeper meaning. He's not just talking about the darkness, the absence of light or something like that. He's not talking about the darkness of creation before God brought light in. He's not just talking about that. When John unpacks darkness throughout his gospel, he's not talking about the absence of light. He's talking about positive evil, that we do dark things. John even expands it from that and says it's almost the environment that we live in. It's not just darkness in us. It's not just dark deeds done by us. But darkness is the world we live in. We are saturated in darkness. Everything is affected by this darkness. It sticks to everything. It has spoiled everything. It's the smell, if you will, that is on everything. Everything is touched by this darkness. And who can overcome it? Who can conquer it? Who can settle it? It's permeated everything, penetrated everywhere. The Bible would say it's gotten so deep, it's gotten to the core of who we are, which the Bible would use the word heart. That darkness has gone all the way to our heart. Just think of that for a moment. Darkness is not a symptom of the flu that you can medicate. (laughs) It's not that we have an illness or we have a cough, (coughs) sniffles. You can take medication over the counter. You could almost kind of be your own doctor, right? 
Well, I, I know what to get when I have a cough. I know what to get when I have the sniffles. I know what to get when I have congestion. I know what to get when I have those things. But there's a whole nother level when your heart has a condition. When your doctor comes to you and says, no, Robitussin and NyQuil, that's not going to do, friend. Your disease is a heart disease. At the core of who you are, the center of who you are, the most essential organ in your body, maybe second to the brain, is not working. It's infected. It is dying. That's a point where we say what? Who's going to come in? I, I, I need a surgeon. I need somebody with more power, more smarts, more skills than me. This is exactly what the Bible describes. We have a darkness that has penetrated to the very core of who we are. The very core of all creation. It touches everything. We don't need a prescription in salvation. We need resurrection. Because in here, it's dead and it's dark. And there's only one person who can solve that darkness. And that's the creator. That's the Christ. He can conquer the darkness. Now, what does that mean for you? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I want you to look at the last verse here. And I want you to think about it, just a couple things here. Things to take away as you enter into the new year. Notice the words that are missing from our last verse there. I'll read the verse again. It says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Notice the word that's not there. There is no word may. May as meaning possibility. The darkness may not overcome it. The light may have victory. There's no sense of possibility, hypothetical reality. Maybe this will happen. What is there? Certainty. The darkness has not overcome it. Notice what else is missing. The word will is not there. It didn't say that the light will overcome the darkness, right? It doesn't speak of it as a future event. What is he saying? This is not only certain, it's done. Think about this for a moment. John is writing his gospel after he's seen the resurrected Jesus Christ. He writes this reality and says, let me tell you that light has come in. That the light of men has come in. The life of God has come in. That the word has taken on flesh. This word that was with God, this word that is God, has now come and he has destroyed the darkness. I've seen it. I've seen the resurrected Jesus Christ. And he says, darkness has not overcome him. There is so much certainty to the Christian hope because it's already been accomplished. The decisive victory has already been won. That's what the resurrection is. Think about it this way. If you're a fan of boxing, it's like watching a heavyweight boxer get into the 12th round. And as that guy comes in and his legs are rubber and his guard is down, his gloves are below his chin, and that boxer turns that right shoulder to get that hook and he drops that left hand. And that great counter puncher comes in and he hits him with an uppercut right on the button and knocks that dude out. As he lays on the mat, you know, I know, his wife or girlfriend, whatever, she knows. I mean, he is out cold. He is drooling, eyes rolling back. But what does the referee still do, even though that guy is clearly not moving? He goes like this. Right? He gives him a count. He's not going to do anything. There are times you can tell that he'll struggle and try to get up. This is what's happened in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Is Jesus Christ, the ultimate counterpuncher, took a shot on the chin, but he got up. And his right hook whoo, is a resurrection hook. And he hit sin and death and darkness right on the button. Boom, and it's on the mat. It's still there. It's still in the ring. Darkness is still here, but it's not moving. It's getting a count, a 10 count. The decisive victory has been won. 
He's not getting up again. We're just waiting for the declaration of it, the celebration of it, the consummation of it, when it all is utterly taken away. But this is how John speaks about the reality of the victory that every Christian has in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The darkness has not overcome it. Light has overcome. The creator has conquered. So what does that mean for you? This is what it means for you. As you gaze into 2020, your life is filled with uncertainties. All the goals, all the resolutions, all the aspirations. Will I lose the weight? Right? Will I get the right job? Will I find my soulmate? Will my team ever win a championship? Right? Whatever it is. We all stare down the corridor of our life. And the hallway is filled with question marks. Filled with uncertainty. But at the end of that hallway is not darkness. At the end of that hallway is light. The end of that hallway is life, is union with God. Everything from this moment forward is uncertain except for the most important thing. Think of that. The most important future event of your life is certain, is strong, is concrete, is anchored. That frees you from so much anxiety, so much worry, so much fear. And I know you've experienced it. I've experienced it. As I've looked at how we did on our New Year's resolutions, and I look about our new New Year's resolutions, that future's uncertain. There's question marks. But knowing that the end of the hallway is not darkness, but light, means that we don't have to cower at the hallway, paralyzed in fear of what's coming. No, we can be freed because we know what's coming. Now, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're curious about Jesus and you're here, and I, I hope you, you feel our hospitality for you, we do that because we believe it's important. I champion that because that's how church was for me. Before I ever started following Jesus, I went to church because I had so many questions and I was so curious about Jesus. I didn't believe everything they believed right away. I didn't. I was very skeptical, but I came because I had questions. So if that's you, let me just speak to you for a moment. I think you would agree with me that we're all gonna die. <laughs> there is an end to the hallway, right? But maybe we don't agree on this point, that there will be a judgment after that end. But I think if we're fair, I don't think you could say that you're certain that there won't be a judgment. I think fairly you would have to say, well, there may be a judgment. Well, let's just entertain that for a moment. If there is a judgment, just ask yourself, how do you think you'll fare? Do you think the verdict will be satisfying? Or does it scare you? I'll be honest, it scared me. That's why I came to church. Because I knew the darkness in me. And I knew if there was a reckoning, a day of judgment, and I stood before God, that I would not win, I would lose. That I would not be found innocent, but I would be found guilty. I hope that you see that yes, the Bible does paint a very clear picture of judgment, but it also paints a extremely compassionate and merciful picture of salvation, that that creator is also the conqueror. And the only one who can change that judgment at the end is Jesus Christ. And my hope and my prayer for you is that you would continue to journey with us as we unpack who Jesus is. I don't want to rush you into any decision, but I want to invite you to slowly walk with us. If you're curious, slowly walk with us as we investigate this Jesus. Church family, will you pray with me? Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for who you are to us in Jesus Christ. We thank you that you have come in and you've spoken into the darkness of our lives and you have spoken in a way that is piercing light, Lord. God, thank you for being active. Thank you for being compassionate. Thank you for rushing after us. 
In this dark world that's been spoiled by our sin, God, you come in and you wear our sin. Thank you, Christ, for dying on the cross, for coming back to life, and give us certainty of resurrection hope. Father, I pray you be with those. God, those who are looking out at the new year, who are looking into the future and they feel a sense of uncertainty, God, I pray that you would calm their heart, that you would calm their spirit, God, that you'd free them from worry. God, we know that there are still question marks as we look forward in the future, but God, knowing that the most important event of the future is certain, God, I pray that you would help those, help those, God, who are following you to have that certainty and release that anxiety in them as they enter into a new year. And God, for those who are here and they're curious, they're still exploring the things of God, God, I pray you'd meet them. God, I pray that you would pique their curiosity for you. God, I pray that they would journey with us on a slow walk with Jesus and just continue to ask that question, who is he? Who is Jesus to me? It's in Christ's name I pray, amen. Well, we believe this church that every conversation with God needs to end on a high note of celebration. So we're gonna sing about the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. So church family, I wanna invite you to stand with me and let's sing and let's celebrate the God who destroyed darkness, who speaks into our darkness that is in us and around us and with piercing light gives us wonderful hope. Church family, let's sing one more time.